At the State Fair, you can travel back in time. Just go to the Winnick family barn, and inside there are daily screenings of the documentary Alaska Far Away, which tells the story of how 200 farm families came to Alaska to build a new life. They came here from the Midwest in 1935 in the height of the Great Depression. From these barren farms in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, 1,500 men, women, and children are moving. Uncle Sam is lending the money. He's taking them to greener pastures in Alaska. In this documentary, you'll hear from some of the original colonists and their children. Joan Juster talked with them when this project got off the ground, and Joan runs a production company out of San Francisco, and you and Paul Hill teamed up. Mm -hmm. Are you glad that you didn't wait much longer? Because, you know, when did this start? We started this project in 1994. As soon as we heard about the colony, we came up here with a camera crew and started filming interviews immediately. We knew there was no time to waste because some of your colonists were getting on in years. At that point, the original colonists were in their 80s and 90s, and we couldn't wait to capture their stories, and we're so glad we did. We interviewed over three dozen of the original parents who came as colonists in 1935. Well, these were called New Deal pioneers because of mm -hmm. the Roosevelt administration that launched this and right. other projects to relocate struggling mm -hmm. Farmers, but you know this got a lot of media attention. Why? I mean, the Alaska Project. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the New Deal created over a hundred resettlement co uh, projects around the country, but this was the only one that moved people over four thousand miles away from their original homes, from the upper part of Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, to similar climate, Matanuska Valley, but much more fertile, much better place to grow things. And they weren't told very much really about what they were going to encounter. Right. Well, like many of the New Deal programs, it came together very quickly. Uh, there had been experimentation in Alaska ahead of time uh, that people knew that you could grow wonderful things here. The experiment farm was here. Meanwhile, the governors of Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, very hard hit area, had been lobbying Washington to help their area. It seemed like a good match. So the solution was to move them out. I'm curious yeah. about this notion of colonists because yeah. it, it, you know, there are already people in Alaska. You know, we had miners come up right. during the gold rush. So, so why did we need to be colonized? Right. The Matanuska Valley was relatively sparsely populated at that time. In 1935, there were about 60,000 people in the entire territory of Alaska, very sparsely settled. And it was very hard for individual farmers to make a go of it in Matanuska. They thought by bringing them together and uh, having them start all at once and build the infrastructure to help support a community that they might have a better go of it. And they did. Well, it sounds like they had a lot of hopes and dreams, too, uh, and hopes yeah. for the colonists. What was the vision that they would accomplish? Well, they were brought up here primarily to be dairy farmers, but also to do uh, vegetable farming. Um, what we learned after the fact was that at that time, Alaska already knew that Japan was looking at Alaska and they needed to build military bases up here. They needed people to feed those bases and help build those bases. Being, bringing up a large group of people all at once helped solve several problems at once. So as part of a grand plan, but despite mm -hmm. all of that, it doesn't seem like, like there were, was much to help these people get settled. Well, it all came together very quickly. The New Deal programs, some of it was just throwing ideas at the wall to see what would stick. This was, uh, the money for this project was approved by Congress on March 9th, 1935. And by the end of April, they were already on a train on their way to Alaska. Well, we have, we have a clip uh, from your documentary, yeah. Alaska Far Away, that mm -hmm. kind of characterizes how the colonists felt about this. So right. let's take a look at okay. this. There was nothing here. I didn't expect to come someplace where there was absolutely nothing. They had a little store in a post office. It, things were a little bit out of kilter there for a while. A lot of stuff arrived before there was a place to put it, including people. They didn't have the tents ready yet for all the colonists, so the colonists had to stay on the train. And we were rustling around for blankets and milk for the babies on the train. 
Boy, and there were some big families there. So yeah. how long did they live in the tents? They arrived, uh, the first batch of colonists arrived in Palmer at 5.30 p.m. on May 10th, 1935. That was the first batch from Minnesota. And um, there were only tents for them when they arrived. Most of the colonists were still living in tents until, some until late October when the snow was flying. So they, 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 it was a long period of camping while their houses were being built. Well, you know, this was a grand social experiment in mm -hmm. many, many ways, and there's almost a social engineering aspect to this. One of the things uh, that when people applied for this, they were told that people with Nordic heritages, Scandinavian people, mm -hmm. would would uh, be preferred. And, and, and in these times today, you know, we would think that'd be code for you have to be white for this project. The, the times were different then, and yes, those were our, we now consider those outdo, outdated notions. They were looking for people who ha, they thought had a good chance of making a living in the cold, frozen north of, of, of uh, Alaska. We all now know now that that doesn't necessarily uh, tie to race. But there was that aspect, too, kind of a, a darker side to this mm -hmm. project where People were very controlled. It wasn't like you got set on this land and right. were free to let uh, capitalism do its work. Right. It was a government project, and with any government project, there are a lot of strings attached. So yes, they created a, a very specific uh, contract that each of the colonists had to sign to take part in the project. Now, picture this: if you're a farmer back in uh, northern Wisconsin or Michigan or Wisconsin uh, or uh, Minnesota and you're having trouble making a living up there, it was a really, really difficult area to make a living. Very remote, very, um, the land wasn't good for farming, everything was, uh, all the trees had been cut over, it was not a good place to be living at that time. So this looked good. So this looked good. Somebody comes along and says, hey, we'll send you to Alaska, we'll set you up on a 40-acre land, on fertile, uh, fertile land, we'll build you a house and a barn, you've got 30 years to pay the government back at low interest. Sounds like a good deal. You're going to go with it no matter what the contract. There were just some odd things like, yeah. you know, the farmers being discouraged from, you know, having their own cash, that they actually used scrip. Right. <laughs> well, there weren't any paying jobs in the valley at that time. Uh, there were very few paying jobs. And so, no, they, they ended up cr uh, creating their own um, currency called bingles. Bingles. <laughs> which I later learned was a generic term for any uh, local currency around small towns in Alaska. So this is very much a national story, kind of yes. how a national policy created this chapter of Alaskan history. Right. And, and not just uh, about the government creating this project, but it's a universal story of people looking for a better life. The government helped them get up here for sure, but um, throughout history people have always uh, during hard times looked for a better place to help raise their families and Alaska turned out to be a very good place for these ha families. Uh, historians will often say that these colonies, the Matanuska colony and some of the other resettlement communities were failures because they didn't repay the government, they, didn't, uh, they weren't hugely successful. But when we talk to the families, it did give them a better life. It brought them up here and they were very happy to be able to make their life in Alaska. So what kind of an impact has your documentary had on, on the people that have lived this experience and those that haven't? <laughs> well, it certainly changed our lives. You know, uh, we spent 23 years working on this story. 23 but years. 23 years, yeah. A lot of amazing <laughs> photographs. I see why. Yeah. But the families are so grateful to us for preserving these stories. If we hadn't recorded these interviews with the original colonists, the colony kids, all of the people who were involved in the colony, that uh, we interviewed over um, over 100 people for this in, uh, for this documentary, and we created an incredible body of uh, oral history. We uh, we did the transcripts of all of those. All of those reside with the Palmer Historical Society. If we hadn't saved those stories would. They would have been lost. And so every day people walk into the Winnick barn at the fair and thank us for preserving this history and sharing this history. Well, it is quite a story. And yeah. thank you, Joan and Paul, yes. uh, for, for doing this because, because it really is an incredible public service. It has been the adventure of our, uh, adventure of our lifetimes and we're very privileged to have done it. All right. Thank, thank you. you.